Akinojan, would you like to introduce yourself to us? Uh, okay. Um, I work on um, international relations and technology issues at Ozean University. Um, are you able to uh, share your screen or? Let me see. Uh, no, it's disabled. I can't do it. Um, could you try again, please? Okay. Can everyone see it now? Yes, Rajam. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so when uh, I got the invitation for this event, um, I wasn't sure what kind of preparation I should do. So um, I said, you know, let me just, um, you know, present whatever recent research um, I'm working on. Um, and this is um, a joint project that whose idea started in 2016 and basically versions of it um, gradually developed and developed and developed. And part of this is right now um, our Tubitak uh, project where um, Efetok Demir Hoca is also a part of. Um, so since we're doing you know, a computational social science um, event, uh, maybe it's, it's good to just like demonstrate um, one example of how computational social science can be deployed um, in a real research setting in order to um, try to answer um, questions related to what I'm working on, which is basically political violence. Um, so when people, uh, you know, other researchers come to me, you know, shall we do joint research projects? Uh, I ask them one thing, is there violence involved? Because uh, that's basically uh, what I worked on. In international relations, in the last 20 years, um, a sub-discipline became extremely popular, which is subnational violence and civil war uh, literature, you know, competitive civil wars. You know, people like uh, Stadis Kadivas, uh, people like Barbara Walter, uh, you know, giants of international relations, um, you know, specifically started to focus on this civil war issue. Um, and within that civil war literature, you know, conflict studies, conflict research, conflict management, or conflict and peace um, studies, sub-sub-discipline uh, emerged. And uh, over the last five to six years, um, a very interesting um, theoretical avenue emerged, which is called um, rebel governance. So rebel governance is uh, a sub 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 field um, of conflict studies, which looks at how violent armed groups, armed non-state actors, such as militant groups, mafia groups, terrorist organizations, um, you know, secessionist organizations, how they um, conduct themselves in a war setting um, in a nonviolent way. So the discipline uh, has so far focused on uh, acute violence, you know, how rebel groups fight, uh, what kind of wars they participate in, who kills whom, that kind of situation. But this new field called rebel governance um it looks at nonviolent uh, activity repertoires of rebels such as um, how they collaborate how they participate in things like lawmaking in municipality work uh, in terms of how um, they provide basic services to citizens such as uh, how they run and operate you know bread factories for example or flour mills um, how they collect garbage, how they establish, um, you know, how they enforce law uh, in that regard. So basically, <clears throat> scholars who focus on this particular kind of conflict, basically rebel governance, what kind of nonviolent things uh, rebels do, they established a new scientific community called the Rebel Governance uh, Network. Um, and within that rebel governance network, people are um, focusing on, you know, how 
um, armed groups, uh, you know, operate? How do they build trust in um, the, the communities that they rule? Uh, what kind of law do they enforce? How do they enforce law? Uh, what happens in areas, gray areas that are uh, in between rebel control and government control, for example, you have government presence, military presence, you also have rebel presence, for example. So I'm part of that network and my research focuses on the communicative aspects of armed groups. How do they communicate in a way that uh, it, it builds support? How do they communicate in a way that intimidates other groups? How do they communicate in a way um, that um, wins them new recruits, for example? So this project of mine is about how armed groups use social media. Uh, because social media is a very important part uh, of war uh, and conflict. And especially since 2011 Syrian war, we see the emergence of cell phones, uh, smartphones, uh, social media in a war situation. So what I do <clears throat> in terms of computational social science is that I harvest the data of those armed groups from a war setting. And I study what they are trying to accomplish with uh, those social media um, posts. So that's basically what I work on. So in order to understand what these groups are doing, uh, we have several precedents. So um, this project of mine looks at what we called conflict uh, event data set. Conflict event data set is a type of data set that um, is a very detailed data set that shows armed interactions between groups. Uh, which group attacks what group, how many people died as a result of which, what kind of weapons that they use, and where. So we already have very sophisticated conflict event data sets in the world that is used by the United Nations, used by NATO, uh, used by national militaries. Uh, and one of the most um, sophisticated of those that is used in scientific research is ACLED, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data um, Project, which is um, every single dot that you see is a conflict event. Um, and when you click on them, when you go to ACLED website, it shows you, you know, what kind of violence, what do they do, who died, etc. Um, one of the oldest and most established of those um, data programs is Uppsala Conflict Data Program, um, which is based in Uppsala University, um, which is used in um, specifically Swedish um, uh, peace missions uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. Um, there's also Peace Research Institute of Oslo, Oslo University's conflict uh, data program. Um, that is uh, used quite extensively. And also we have things like uh, global terrorism data sets by University of Maryland. So uh, what we see here uh, is that already universities um, have established you know, conflict event data sets that focus on what kind of armed events are happening around the world and they basically log them. Um, so this is basically a snapshot from an armed conflict event data set. Um, it basically has a unique conflict event identifier. This is a CSV file, so it's comma separated. Um, those of you who don't know what a CSV file is, it's comma separated values. It's, it's a type of tabular um, data set that you can open in you know, R or Excel or even I think like WordPad. Um, what it, this contains is that this kind of a data set can be opened in uh, multiple data analysis uh, programs. As, as I mentioned, Excel is one of them, R is one of them, Python is one of them, Stata is one of them, SPSS, MATLAB. You know, it's, it's a very universal and easily um, transmittable kind of um, data. And as you see, all of the um, data here are separated by commas. So you have data number one, comma, data number two, comma, data number three, comma, data number four, um, comma. So 
it has a unique conflict event identifier. It has a specific identifier for side one, which side is attacking, an event identifier for side two, which side is being attacked. Um, and it actually contains uh, other um, data when you go into um, the readme file of the data set. It basically gives you, um, uh, you know, a, a uh, explanation of, of what each data, you know, where the conflict is happening, who's attacking whom, what's the alternative name of that organization, when does this attack uh, take place, how many people have died, so on and so forth. This is what a conflict event data set uh, looks like. So what I'm trying to do with my own research is that all of these conflict event data sets, you know, ACLEDS, Global Terrorism Database, uh, Uppsala, Oslo, uh, these conflict data sets are very respectable. But you need armies of assistants. You need region experts. You need, um, you know, assistants, interns. Um, so you really need a very large research group in order to build and maintain um, these um, data set. So, and there's also a thing called bias. You know, how do you know about a particular violent event? You read it on the news. Um, these, you know, Uppsala or Oslo people, they, you know, track the news in real time uh, every single day, every single hour. When they come across a particular event, they uh, log it into the database. But Mainstream media misses a lot of those events. So until a violent event becomes a mainstream news, it has to go through several you know, uh, gatekeepers. One, there has to be a media group that's available there uh, who can actually go in and um, you know, report about that incident. Most of the time, um, due to war conditions, most media groups don't exist in frontline war. So we don't, we end up missing a lot of data um, because nobody is there to report that violent event. Um, the second one is normally countries don't want these things to be reported, especially if that violent event is against their national interests. So in social media, we have an alternative um, avenue for, for research uh, because now, we don't need media groups. We don't need reporters. Every single militant, every single terrorist can actually, you know, take a photo, take a video, post it up online, and we get conflict event data without a, an assistant, without any intern. Um, so what is the relationship between social media and war? One, it really enables sub-state actors to cheaply conduct global propaganda. Uh, you no longer re need a radio station. You no longer need a TV station. You no longer need um, the support of reporters. You just need a Twitter account, a smartphone, and you can do your own propaganda yourself. That type of communication is not always uh, accurate because communication and mixed communication is equally facilitated. Not everything that we see on social media is correct, which is a challenge for researchers. Um, and most of the time, these groups do these kinds of social media posts in order to increase um, recruitment. But we, we don't always get quality recruitment. You know, sometimes uh, people get cannon fodder, like cheap and expendable kind of recruits. Um, whereas veterans, you know, people who actually know how to fight, they don't really follow social media. You, they, you know, they have to. They have their own, you know, old and established, you know, trust networks, and that's basically how they recruit and fight. It significantly enabled researchers' ability to gather large volumes of granular data with qualitative and quantitative. You don't really need to do quantitative research with social media. You can do beautiful qualitative research as well. Um, Based on our research, um, we discovered that social media has no effect on conflict intensity um, or likelihood. Social media hasn't changed how wars are fought, but it changed how they are communicated. Um, so when we look at social media and war, selfies are hugely important, right? Um, because when we look at 
you know, imaginations of war from you know, 50 years ago or 40 years ago. We see, you know, depictions of robot soldiers. We see depictions of highly sophisticated uh, military units. What we ended up having in the battlefield is smartphone and selfies. Everybody takes a selfie. If you're a militant, if you're about to attack a position, you take a selfie. If you are um, a national member of the military, if you're just headed to the battlefield, you take um, a selfie. <clears throat> if you're back in the base, just chilling, you take a selfie. So in the last 10 years, what we see from battlefields and social media is enormous amounts of selfie data. Like you have no idea how much selfie data we have. And it is kind of like counterintuitive, like war is supposed to be a secret thing. Battlefield is supposed to be a secret thing. Uh, but these, these things are supposed to be secret or hidden. But no, most militants and most soldiers take enormous amounts of selfie from the battlefield. They post it on social media. Quite a large number of them have geolocation data. So they have a specific location data. And compared to more traditional and established data sets like UCDP Prio, uh, ACLED, GTD, we have quite uh, highly granular, highly you know, high quality um, war data. And it's unprecedented, never in the history of conflict research, we have this kind of uh, enormous data uh, emerging. And um, when you like follow these selfies specifically, you kind of see similar patterns, for example, like when we look at the previous picture, this guy is this guy, right? It, it emerges, um, you know, quite frequently in multiple um, the data sets as well. Like later, I actually learn that this group is actually this group. And uh, you can basically, you don't need like computational methods. You can just like look over an extended period of time. But these selfies also contain quite a large number of text data, right? These people check in to a particular location, like I'm headed to Crimea, um, they have a lot of text data, like I'm going to Crimea with whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm in Syria, I'm about to attack this position. My group is the best, all other groups are bad kind of. So we have several data types here. One, we have text data, which is a text that is, uh, written by these armed groups themselves. So it's very representational data, which is very good. We most of the time have location data, uh, not always, but most of the time. Normally, um, if you are doing geotagged social media research in you know, normal conditions, you have maybe 2%. 2.3% uh, of the social media, entire social media posts have location data on. In a war setting, uh, the percentage of location data actually increases to about 35, 36%, which is very, very interesting. But in a war setting, location data uh, becomes more uh, widely used. So it's very important. We have a timestamp. When was this? Um, you know, selfie, or when was the social media post taken? What is the date? What is um, the specific hour and minute um, that is being done? How many people liked it? Who are the people who liked that social media post? Who commented on it, right? So we have quite an extensive types of both actual data and metadata uh, about what's happening in the, in the war. And we have sufficient amount of data uh, and quality of data that we can actually do computational uh, methods with. So it's quite valuable. Uh, and it's really not um, a new thing. Like back in um, 2014, 2013, uh, most intelligence organizations in the world were already using uh, geolocated 
social media posts uh, in order to um, see you know what you know terrorist groups are uh, doing. A lot of ISIS militants, for example, used to you know turn on their geolocation information and post a lot of tweets. You know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Um, they were reckless, but it was also a way of showing how confident they were about what they were doing. Like they're um, turning their uh, you know, um, location services on and they're not afraid of being found. And 2014 onwards, um, most NATO intelligence organizations started to um, use these um, media posts as a way to conduct drone strikes, for example. So this guy is particularly famous. Uh, he's the first uh, person in the world um, who was killed by a drone strike about two minutes after he posted um, a tweet with a geo uh, tag on. So he's the first uh, casualty of um, geocoded uh, tweet. It's very important. But most of the time in a war situation, you see tweets like this, like I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Uh, hashtags, whatever, videos that are attached to it. And it becomes quite important uh, as research material. Um, these are other, uh, you have cases such as, you know, militants taking their own um, selfies, like we're chilling, like, you know, Roja, whatever. Um, you also have uh, the opportunity for uh, militant groups to advertise themselves, you know, what kind of a group we are. Why should you join us? Why is our fight particularly um, important and whatever? So there's a lot of material uh, on this. So um, beginning with, um, sorry, uh, beginning with 2016, even back to 2014, not just in military, not just in war zones, but in a lot of places, um, you start to see a lot of selfies. And this is when um, computational selfie research started to really pick up. You know, there are so many selfies on uh, social media. What can we learn from those selfies? So someone scraped 40,000 Tinder selfies to make a facial data set for AI experiments. Yeah, so, so many uh, faces online. Your Instagram selfies are being scraped and sold to brands. Yeah, like you can do, you know, automated, you know, brand detection out of those selfies, and you can basically look at which brand is becoming very popular. So you can have computational tools um, on Python. Most of them are on Python, like they're they're most on R as well. Um, but you can basically do. Um, you know, introduce set parameters. You know, I want um, a selfie. Day. I want social media posts uh, from this particular coordinate. I want social media posts from this particular coordinate. I also had a Ukraine project. So I want social media posts from this particular coordinate. Now, every image that you take with your cell phone uh, has a metadata in which it contains which camera it was taken with, whether it's front camera. So you, it, it actually sells, it tells whether it's taken with this part of the camera or whether this part of the camera. Now, if you're taking an image like this, chances are it's a selfie. Nobody uses like camera like this, right? Because you need to see if you're using the back camera, you have to see what you're taking a photo. So it's very unlikely for a front camera file to contain a kind of image that is something other than a selfie, because this is the selfie camera, right? It's, you, don't, you, you take a selfie with this. You don't use this camera to take something, um, a photo of something else. So. I want selfies that are coded with the front camera code. And I basically am doing text-based entity extraction, uh, which is basically I'm you know, searching for a particular group, a particular event type, 
let's say I'm scraping data about aerial bombardments, for example, airstrikes, or I'm looking at social media posts. I just want um, you know, ISIS specific or a splinter group of ISIS. Uh, I want data from um, them. Then uh, this is kind of technical. Um, uh, maybe, you know, for undergraduates, this may be a bit advanced, but I'm doing redundancy check because most of the time when you get social media data and you're trying to extract event data from uh, social media, what you ended up getting is a lot of reports of the same event. So let's say somebody takes a, a rocket propelled grenade, fires on a tank. It's an event. It's a violent conflict event. But on social media, let's say 10 people take the video of it and another 20 people just you know, share the photo of it. And you have 30 different reports of the same incident. I don't want those 30 reports. I want them to be distilled into one single event data. So level one, I have to reduce multi-language reports into a single uh, report. So uh, Farsi, Arabic, Kurdish, English, whatever. Um, I have to use automated translation uh, in order to you know, reduce them into a single report at scale. I have to use automated reverse Im image search, which is Google or ImageRadar and video fingerprinting to search those videos <clears throat> against um, the history of the internet so that if there is redundancy, if this is something old, um, I have a way to verify it. Or most of the time what happens is like in 2014, in Afghanistan, somebody shoots down a helicopter and then there's a video of it. And then somebody in Syria takes that video and posts it uh, in 2018 as if it's something new. No, it was like taken four years ago in Afghanistan. So you have to do reverse image search. You have to do reverse video fingerprinting in order to do that. And then even if you do computational redundancy check, you are still have to, uh, you still need region experts and language experts. For example, if you're working on armed Kurdish groups, you're going to come up with a term called Palestine very frequently, which means protection. But it can refer to Palestine Zanyari, which is a different group, Yekinan Palestine Gal, which is another group. And it can also be like a genetic group that like a couple of kids established like yesterday uh, in their neighborhood. Or it can be Palestine as a word, like you have to have a region expert, a field and language expert um, to do this at the final level. But um, human verification is very important, but it's one thing for human verification to verify between five or six reports. And it's something entirely different when human reports uh, has to verify 5,000 or 8,000 reports. So I'm doing level by level first automated redundancy check so that my human verifier has as few um, reports as possible. This is a very Kurdish armed group specific search. I also have um, a, you know, a jihadi group specific search term. I also have in Ukraine uh, a Russian separatist kind of search term. But what you usually need in a search term is a date range. Um, you need specific countries and coordinates. <clears throat> this is very complicated because it's uh, like text mining, text analysis, like aerial attack. Yes, I'm looking for aerial attack, arm clash, border incident, fine. But how many forms of aerial attack exists in language. So how do, for example, how many types of references in Arabic do you have for an aerial attack? How many types of pipeline damage you have in Farsi? How many times um, security operation or smuggling related um, text type exists in Kurdish, for example? How many mentions of shooting curfew or protest exist in Turkish. So what you need is do you need what we call a corpus, a word corpus um, of multi-language events that correspond to every single event type. And this is basically, I mean, it's just like one paragraph, but like this particular event, this particular data type took 
more than a year and a half to uh, actually uh, formulate because corpus building, uh, text, uh, bag of word building, it takes enormous amounts of time. Uh, you can then focus on groups. I'm looking at these kinds of groups, whatever. You can also look at uh, names and everything. I have this for, again, jihadi groups. I have this for Ukraine. Um, very recently, we started a project uh, on Colombian drug cartels. So we have um, this in Spanish as well. Um, so this is basically how you do uh, search terms. And what we ended up having is um, this, we basically convert this into like a nice um, data visualization because we were back then we were trying to get like a large funding out of this so we prepared this later so this map is our conflict event data sets that we extracted from social media posts um, from 1st of april 2015 to 1st of october 2015 this was six years ago i'm getting old and it's very depressing anyway so the yellow parts are um, the pipeline networks that you see across Turkey, in Syria, and in Iraq. Here is Iran. And this is um, you know, the Kirkuk uh, Jehan <clears throat> pipeline. These are Turkey's own <clears throat> internal uh, pipelines. So every like bluish, is this called cyan or something? The color, light blue colors are armed um, events. So what we're doing is that how many armed events are happening, whether it's a sabotage, pipeline sabotage, whether it's a protest, whether it's a shooting, that happens very close to oil pipeline networks, for example. And um, what we're doing here is that these dotted signs are total amount of violent events. And we basically looked, can we pinpoint events that are specific to one particular pipeline, such as the Jehan uh, pipeline network. Uh, so we're basically using a model uh, of um, armed you know, entity extraction um, that is around you know, 50 kilometers uh, in the vicinity of the Jehan pipeline network, for example. So we see that Jehan network events are very separate uh, than total um, events. So when there are peaks in Jehan network, like here, like here, like here, uh, they're very separate from uh, other types of violent events uh, that are happening in the area, which is um, a really interesting um, finding that we had. Then whatever, we uh, managed to get funding for this project. And um, this was um, a successful project. So when I do this um, for um, all conflict events, both like Kurdish related, ISIS related, free Syrian army related, all conflict events, in Syria and Iraq between January 2014, Jan uh, July 2017, this is what the raw data looks like. Every single dot is a conflict event data that we extracted from uh, social media posts. Of course, since this is raw data, it's not clean, which is why you have like renegade data points in the sea that are like probably um, you know, miscoded or something like that. But what you should look for in these things are trends, which is like this cluster is a trend. This line is a trend. This cluster is a trend. This cluster is a trend. So instead of like looking at like, why is this dot here? Why is this dot here? Focusing on, cl focus on clusters. Like this, there's something happening here. There's something major happening here. This is probably a very important uh, transportation way. Like this is a linear network. Probably there's a lot going on in this. Probably this is a highway and a major supply route. I Like without even knowing what's here, just looking at event data, I can infer a lot. 
probably this is a very strategic position, state resort, which of course it's a very important strategic position, but let's assume that I don't know anything about these things. So what I can infer is that this probably is also a road network. See, there is like a linear um, trend happening here. There is something here. There's a block here, but see that that linear, this linear trend also exists here, also exists here. So I'm assuming, again, without knowing much about the region, this is probably a major highway. This is also a major highway, and it probably connects to from Syria into Iraq, and it goes all the way into here. So this is probably a very major supply route between Syria and Iraq, and probably armed groups are using this highway, this supply route, in order to um, you know, logistically send um, other groups um, you know, material or whatever. Probably when I go to Google Earth, I will find that this is a highway. So it's a very valuable kind of um, data source, what you can do with it. And even like from raw data without much analysis, I can get a lot of trends here. So uh, after I clean this data, of course, it became uh, even more substantially uh, important. But then uh, what I um, said is that, you know, let's use some um, between the centrality. It's a, like a physic, physics uh, term. Um, can we look at the center of gravity of war in Syria. Um, and what we basically ended up uh, having is that we pinpointed this particular village. I forgot the name of it. Um, maybe I should add them to the slides. But what we basically did was between the centrality on uh, every single armed event that you see here and get um, kind of like the between us coefficient of those events. And we basically said that um, and at the time, it was like um, an experimental project. Uh, we were kind of having fun with it. We said, you know, this particular village here is going to be where ISIS is going to make its final stand. And three years after we <clears throat> finalized this project, uh, we looked at New York Times and ISIS really did um, conduct its final stand in this particular village. And at the time, you know, we ended the project. But uh, we were really shocked, like uh, we kind of predicted that this would be the place and it really was that place. So these things have a lot of interesting um, applications uh, for a lot of things. And then we said, you know, can we also do the same thing uh, in Ukraine, for example, the uh, both the Crimea war and uh, the Donbas uh, area? Of course, what you're seeing here are, again, like major clusters, major clusters, um, larger clusters, larger clusters. Uh, here, what we observe is, again, a linear trend. Probably it's either um, a waterway, uh, a river, uh, which is being fought over quite significantly, or it's probably a highway. Or what I'm seeing here is that here's a linear relationship, here's a linear trend. Uh, probably these are very either important waterways or um, highways. So when we apply the same model, um, change uh, the corpus text towards actors, we <clears throat> employed um, a native Ukrainian speaker and a person who uh, knows the politics of the region, of course. So. Uh, I'm not just doing computational research, I'm also doing computation and uh, <clears throat> also qualitative research as well out of this. But this is basically um, what we got. Um, natural language processing is something else, but this is to give you an idea uh, <clears throat> over uh, how much we can learn about just raw social media data uh, and selfie data. Um, and maybe before I close um, the session, um, I can basically say several things like why do militants or soldiers share selfies on the battlefield so much that uh, is just like every single dot you see here is a social media post. Most of them are selfies. Um, 
why do they share so much? Um, one reason that I found is that in a battlefield, everyone gets bored, bored to death. Like everyone is very, very bored. You don't, don't imagine the front line as something like where people just fire on each other all the time. A front line is most of the time a very silent and a very boring place, which is um, for seven days, eight days, nothing happens. You basically wait uh, for extended periods of time. Then suddenly some firing happens. And then again, for seven to eight days, nothing happens. So frontline is actually a very boring place. Uh, and you have to wait a lot in a frontline. So it's most of the time waiting, 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 waiting. Nothing happens. We have to wait, wait, wait. So. In that waiting, two things happen. You either smoke a lot of cigarettes to pass time or you play with your cell phone for an extended duration of time. So you have to understand that frontline is a boring place. And in order to pass time, uh, cell phones, smartphones, and social media uh, are really lifesavers for people, whoever is in the front lines. They look at Instagram, they look at Twitter all the time, and they share a lot of stuff uh, as well. The second thing is most people in the front lines kind of understand that, you know, death is part of the business, right? You, you can die. So they're very much interested in leaving some kind of memory uh, behind. So they're very much interested in sharing what's happening today, why they're there, why them fighting matters. <clears throat> so um, that's why uh, they share a lot of selfies. They share a lot of information about the group that they're working on. They share a lot of uh, information about what's happening in the battlefield and the front lines. And when you look at history, this is the kind of data that we never even dreamt of getting. Like imagine uh, a war that was happening in 1950s, uh, 1850s, 1750s. This kind of real time, highly granular battlefield frontline data, we never really, really had. So social media gives us a very interesting and an unprecedented <clears throat> access into uh, a battlefield uh, because Participants in the war use social media a lot. Um, <clears throat> and as researchers, we have uh, very significant amounts of tools, computational um, social science tools, network analysis, text mining, text analysis, geotag, geolocation analysis, geospatial uh, intelligence, what we call GIS, geographic information systems. Um, we can basically do very simple, uh, you know, time series analysis uh, out of these things like I um, showed here. So essentially, I'm, I made this presentation in order to give you an idea on you know, what you can do um, in, uh, from, from a perspective of computational social science if you're interested in a war conflict. Um, and uh, whatever. Uh, and then Emre Hoxha, uh, he works on you know, migration, which is a different dimension of these things. Tuba Hoxha is going to speak tomorrow. Uh, she focuses on um, you know, monitoring large-scale migration, which is also you know, a byproduct of war. So uh, really studying war, militants, migrants, migration, um, large-scale population flows. And these things have become hugely important in the last few years. And like Renemlo just said, like even if you're in a very qualitative department, like sociology, like history, for example, um, there is a huge trend that is gravitating towards these tools because um, computational tools are very, very cool, but also the kind of data that we're working on uh, really provide us huge insights into uh, what is happening in places that are normally very difficult to monitor. Uh, so these kinds of tools can be used to study war, study migration, 
study what people are doing in um, a natural disaster like earthquake, like floods. Uh, during COVID period, a lot of people uh, use these tools in order to you know, monitor whether people are really leaving their homes or not, how much they're leaving their homes, uh, whether they're respecting you know, social distancing or whatever. There's a lot to be done, but I'll just stop here and take uh, your questions. So um, thank you very much. Let me also um, stop screen sharing and return back to um, this session. So do we have any questions? I'll let Onurcan moderate. Okay, yeah, to acknowledge them. Uh, I'm sure um, all of us are very impressed uh, by your research. Um, there are two questions in the chat um, from Ipsorish is the first. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. It is impressive that geolocations and selfies answer many questions on conflicts. I'd like to ask a question on the integrity of the data samples. Have you observed manipulated geolocations as a part of this disinformation campaign in the war crisis that might change any outcome? If yes, could you elaborate its characteristics? Yeah, there are several um, questions in this. So I'd like to break it down because it's very, very important. So, um, Integrity of data samples. Uh, social media event data is very dirty. Like cleaning data is most of the time 99% of your job. Um, and, and analyzing, especially like social media data and war, 99% um, of your job is cleaning data. 1% uh, of your job is visualizing and analyzing it. So um, Nils Weidman in Constance, he's like very big on this issue of, you know, can we use social media data? How much can we use social media data? Um, his, one of his most famous research uh, articles is about um, the kind of social media that we're getting from a battlefield is a place that has at least 2G or 3G networks. There has to be a cell phone tower. But in a war situation, these cell phone towers are destroyed, right? So we only get social media conflict event data from places where there are cell phone towers and we don't know anything that's happening in areas that, where social, that, that uh, cell phone towers are destroyed. So what you see in a map is that there's a huge cluster here and nothing is here. And why is that? Because here you have a cell phone tower. Here you don't have a cell phone tower because it's destroyed. So that is a big issue that the field is trying to resolve uh, at the moment. Uh, have you observed manipulated geolocations as a part of this information campaign in the war crisis? Yes, some people, they, like how do you manipulate geotype? Do you use VPN? Uh, most of the time. So instead of um, you know, it's something happening here, you, that thing happens uh, in Colombia. But then in order to think about like why would somebody manipulate uh, a geocode? Now, why would you share something from a battlefield? Like if you're a militant, if you are some. So the incentives for a non-combatant, a civilian, uh, is to basically acquire more followers. See, I'm the person who's sharing uh, what's happening here uh, in real time. So they want to do citizen journalism a lot. So they want to actually attract a lot of uh, attention for a non-combatant. Let's assume you're a kid, 17 years old. Um, there's, some, there's a war happening. You take photos and videos in a battlefield. Now, do you have any intentions to misrepresent a geotag? No, because you want to be like a citizen journalist. You want people to follow you. You want people to retweet what you're retweeting or share what you're retweeting. So um, your incentives to be as accurate as possible. Let's look from the perspective of a combatant, a person who's actually fighting. Um, they also know that if they manipulate a geocode, nobody's going to take them seriously next day or next week or next month. So they also have an incentive to not misrepresent 
a geocode. Who manipulates geocodes are basically people who are secondary sharers, uh, not the people who are actually from the battlefield, but people that are trying to either um, use that image as a part of one part of you know political campaign, you know how look at how good these people are fighting, or divert and distract, as I say, as you say, disinformation campaign. So we see a lot of um, manipulated geocode locations, but we also this is just part of um, a big menu of misrepresented items. So a photo that was shared five years ago somewhere else becomes reshared here as, as if it's something new. A video that was uh, taken six years ago elsewhere is shared uh, here as well. So not just geocodes, but also images, <clears throat> uh, videos. So for example, let's say <clears throat> one group is fighting with another group and it's losing. And it wants to do two things. One, intimidate the other side. Two, it is seeking to stop mutinies, people fleeing from uh, its own group, right? So if they're losing, especially. So especially the losing side has an incentive to misrepresent what is happening. So most of the time, what they do is that they take another video from five years ago and say, look how much we're winning, or look, did we basically uh, destroy this particular location? So there is a lot of uh, misrepresentation uh, in a war. This information campaign can be one of those. Um, now, the second part of this question is, I think, a different question. This information campaign in the war crisis that might change any outcome. I think this is a separate question. Can these misrepresentations change the outcome of the war? Um, so far, I haven't come across any information that it can, um, but I think there's no study so far about this particular thing, this information campaign in the war crisis that might change um, outcome. So can this information change the outcome of the war, for example, it, that does a misrepresentation change how the other crew behaves? Um, that needs like specific empirical research. Like we don't have research on that yet. Uh, so I don't want to say whether it does or uh, it doesn't. Probably we're going to have cases in which it does, cases in which it doesn't. So next step would be to focus on you know, what kinds of events have to happen, where this information changes the outcome of the war, what kind of events have to. So there needs to be a lot of research in that uh, area. But yes, 99% of my time is uh, cleaning data uh, because there's a lot of stuff going on, even when there is no misrepresentation, even when all the data is accurate, still 99% of your job is cleaning data. Thank you very much, Rajan. Uh, there's another question in the chat um, from Yujar Topçur. He says, does banning social media like Azerbaijan did in the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war reduce the information coming from the operational environment? Or do people somehow find solutions for sharing pictures and tweets? Um, this is something that I <clears throat> observed. Banning social media has no effect at all about what we can find from uh, war zone. Um, banning social media is one of the most useless things anyone can do, especially if there's something like um, a natural disaster, or if there's a protest, if there's a war. There are so many other forms of getting social media data uh, that, and people actually know how to circumvent uh, those social media bans. They can use VPNs, they can open up a new account as if it's from, as if they're uh, joining from, you know, another region. There, there are so many ways of circumventing social media bans that, uh, for example, in the Nagorno-Karabakh war, uh, social media was banned, but the social media data sets that we got from Nagorno-Karabakh is enormous. Uh, there's, there's really no effect. Like bans have no use at all. Like we still get tons and tons of data as if there is no banning. 
Okay, uh, are there any more questions for Akonoja? Okay, if not, uh, Akonoja, thank you very much cool. for accepting our invitation. Thank you I so think... much. This is this was really fun, and I think you guys are the first student organization who did a computation social sciences uh, summit, and like do this every year, like make it a tradition because. Um, like right now we're a very handful of people, but probably <clears throat> people here, other people that are working on these things, like in the next years, you're going to have more and more speakers. So like my suggestion, this is an excellent idea. Do this like a tradition, like do this every year. Um, and uh, it will probably be you know, one of the most popular student events, not just in Turkey, but around the wider region so good. congratulations on this thank you Ajahn. thank you that's our intention to do it uh traditional cool, cool. take care thank you Ajahn. um rustam hocam merhabalar hi um would it be okay if he started five minutes late because uh, we couldn't give a break uh, in the previous session sure okay sure so yeah. let's give a 10 minute break everyone and let's be back in uh, two seven oh two also.